Hi, welcome to Smoking with Swami. Today we've got Mike Lewis with us, who's uh, served with us on the can uh, Cannabis the Emerald Cup judges panel. I've known him for a bunch of years, and he said he just really would love to help me out with my grow because, uh, as I've said before, I'm working now towards sustainability rather than buying stuff out of packages. And Mike has a company called uh, Synergy Agricultural Products, yep. and he's going to talk to us about... Uh, Microbial life and all that sort of biological stuff. soil enhancement. Biological soil enhancement. Okay, so uh, and actually, he started talking before, and he started talking about how Mother Nature, Nature just does this thing. So I kind of want him just to repeat that little thing that he was uh, giving us earlier. So about Mother Nature. Yeah, what what we build is kind of the common term has been compost tea, really, and when we look at it what we're doing is we're doing biological enhancement of the microorganisms that mother nature has currently present in in soil uh, there's many levels of it from bacteria single cell organisms multi-cell organisms uh, single cells include little critters like protozoa that love to feed and eat protozoa. the mold we're talking microorganisms that are in the soil. and That are already there all the time. Yeah. And Mother Nature has her ways of dealing with her good guys and her bad guys. The bad guys are uh, insects, predatory insects, mold, mildew, in our world, spider mites, things uh -huh. of that sort. Yeah, right, right. Those are the bad guys. Yeah, right. Then there's the good guys, the uh, ba beneficial bacterias. The nematodes, beneficial nematodes, nematodes uh, single cell organisms such as protozoas, which feed on mold, mildew, powdery mildew, I in see. the wine world, botrytis, uh -huh. mold. So the uh, nematodes are tiny microscopic little worms or something. Yeah. They're, what do they eat? They, they, they feed on eggs and larvae of the predatory insects. They love uh, spider mites eggs and mm, larvae. Mm, one of their, their favorite foods. So the whole thing is to let nature deal with the problems that in the past we want to spray something or pour something or all that sort of stuff. Nature it's, has a way to do it. Exactly. She has her way to do it. But what happens in Mother Nature is sometimes there's a lot more bad guys than there are good guys. And they infest the plant. They set up a colony. They breed. They create a home and they destroy your plants. So what we're doing is we're taking the good guys and we're putting them in a what's known as a compost tea brewer. Uh, it's a water system that we're dramatically increasing the oxygen content of the water. When we look at standing water, it's at about two parts per million of oxygen. When we're done with it, we're taking it up to about 8.3, 8.5, over a 400% increase in oxygen levels. So this the, is like a tank. You told me you have a 150-gallon tank. Is yeah, there a smaller yeah. one? We'd go all the way from f a 5-gallon uh -huh. system, which is basically a 5-gallon bucket, uh -huh. up to multi-thousand-gallon systems. Well, I uh, saw when you had an 800-gallon one at the Emerald Cup or something like yeah, that. Yeah, we do, uh, not common, but... Not rare, the 800s. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, but that's, you know, for someone my size, you know, 25 plants, a little more than that, maybe the 150 gallon would be what you're saying? Yeah, typically I like to figure two gallons per plant, three gallons per plant. How often? It, depend, it also depends on whether you're on your medium. If you're hydroponic, if you're in the ground, if you're in an above ground grow bag. Uh-huh. So it's, you have to Excuse come in really, sure, sure, that's what we're doing here. So you have uh, to have kind of a site inspection or what, it, well, it's all, a site it's, inspection, but it's, it's a, tailored to what you're a doing. A consultation. Yeah, it's tailored like to, to what you're doing. talk about what you're doing, figure it uh -huh. out, make it best for what your particular applications are. I see. So getting back to the organisms. Right. We typically look at, we, we use a very, very high quality compost, worm castings, uh, forest humus, humic acids, and then we have a food supplement. This is where the biological life lives in these basic substances, the castings, the compost, the forest humus. Then when we put them in the water and we bring these oxygen levels up really high, they start to reproduce. 
and they start to reproduce almost at a dramatic rate. All these microorganisms, we've been talking about the protozoa, the nematodes. Exactly. Now, the nematodes don't so much reproduce in that as so much as the the protozoas, the anthropods, the bacteria. The beneficial microbes. Yeah. They're doubling every two hours, every three hours, they double in population. Because of the oxygen you're putting in. Exactly. And then they need food. They need something to eat during this reproduction when they're having all these babies. So we, we they need a carbohydrates. Old tradition was molasses. Molasses yeah, was good, but you have to be very careful with it because what will happen with molasses, if you use too much of it, it creates a bloom in the bacteria levels. It's indicated by a very high foam concentrate on the tea. You talk, see people that talk about foam on tea. Well, a little bit of foam is good, but when you get a really high level, that means you got too much oxygen or too much bacteria I bloom. See. The bacteria consumes the oxygen. Oxygen levels drop down, and the higher primates or the higher life organisms start to die of an oxygen starvation. Oh, and the same compost tea that you're now trying to say is full of Exactly. So Ah. we want to keep this carbohydrate level at a good, smooth level. So what we use, rather than molasses, we use a combination of oat, quinoa, spelf, uh, alfalfa flowers, sea kelp, and an insect frass. And this is this is all the food. This is the food supplement Ah. for the biological life. So we and so we put that in with the with the biologicals. They consume this. They make babies. We start off with I don't know. Start off with maybe two thousand of these protozoas in a teaspoon of liquid. By the time we're done, we've probably got two hundred thousand, two hundred and fifty thousand. So now, what do these protozoas do when they get in the ground? They assimilate and they come up into the plant, and they. And in the soil also, they break down the organic matter in the soil, but more they feed on uh, mold spores. And they eat the mold. They eat the sp- don't eat the mold the, the itself, spores. but ah. they eat the spores, ah. which breaks the life cycle of the mold. Oh, okay. Same with the, we talked about the nematodes and the right. anthropods. They eat the eggs and the larvae of the predatories, caterpillars, cutworms, Spider mites, aphids, wow. they literally go into their little caverns and feed on their eggs. Wow. If they got into one on one war with an aphid or a spider mite, the spider mite would kick its ass. It's, it doesn't do that. But there's, but there's pe- thousands of them. There's hundreds of the nematodes, but hundreds. thousands of the anthropods, uh-huh. bill, millions of the protozoas. And then we go into the bacteria, the beneficial and now bacteria. We're in the billions of bacteria. Now we're talking billions. <laughs> <laughs> Bacterias have two functions. They go into the predatory's digestive system, the mites, the aphids, and they paralyze their digestive so they can't <coughs> digest their food and they starve to death, t- typically two to three days, and they're uh-huh. dead. And then they become part of the compost too. When they they're break they're... down and they get uh-huh. into the organic matter. And then the 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 uh, single cells and the, and the multi-cell nematodes, they're eating the eggs... The bacterias are getting the adults, so we've got them on both sides. Ah. When we do, tradition has been spray them with neem oil. What neem oil does is it literally suffocates them with an oil film. Ah. And it kills the adults, and the eggs are very happy, and they live quite fine, and they hatch, and everything's on its way again. Uh Mother Nature gets them on both sides. Ah. It gets the eggs, it gets the adults. And the same with the mold. We talk about the spores, but it doesn't eat the actual mold. But I spray it on everything from melons to comfy and all different kinds of things. And you get this gray film at the end of September. Mm -hmm. You spray this in three or four days, it's gone. Uh, I have, uh, you know, Kevin at Wonderland, at the nursery, he was telling me he sprays now his, his... his beds, his seed beds, he sprays the floor where the cement is, the bricks, where they used to get this green. And what's he spraying it with now? Tea. The compost, compost tea. tea. And the compost tea is eating all the mold and the fungus and the green shit on this trays and this mold things, and the place looks beautiful. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, besides using it in this, to help the plant growth, we didn't even talk about the mycorrhizal. 
which is All right. again a major part of the tea <laughs> that gets into the root right. structure that right. literally tells dictates to the plant how it's going to absorb so now nutrients. Let's, let's talk about mycorrhizal because we all <laughs> just love mycorrhizal, right? So if you go in the forest and you kind of scrape away that mm. top layer of duff, that's what we talk the forest humus. Right, and then uh, there's this white kind of lacy stuff. That's what it's all about. And that's under there, and that's kind of a universal. That's like the largest living organism on the planet, or something yep. like that. Yep, it is. And on top. And that's it, what mycorrhizal comes from. That's what it is. That's what it is. It is. It's in. It's micro. In, micro it's, is like it's small, a right? It's and rhizal are the. It's a fungal. Uh, it gives off spores. These spores divide, they s split, and it, put them in the tea, put them in the oxygen, they right. split and they divide, oh, you see. get more and more and more. So for years, I, whenever I transplant my starts and so on, I'll take a little bit of mycorrhizal and put it in the hole where I put, yeah. the, put the thing is, right? Yeah. They seem to like that a lot. They, on the scientific world, the data shows us that a plant inoculized with the mycorrhizal will use 70% less nutrients and 30% less water and produce better results. Wow, that's significant. Yeah. Wow, it's, wow. It's probably one of the major, major benefits of a tea that, uh -huh. I, you know, most of the time I speak about the, the, the critters. The critters. <laughs> the bacteria, the single cells, uh, the multi-cells. They're both really, our friends and our enemies, right? They're really the core of it is the mycorrhizal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's key. Everybody remember that. Now, you can also just put it in your soil. You can right? buy it. You you can, can buy well, they're pretty it. expensive. A bag they're like this is 150 200 bucks or something like that, right? Yeah, and it grows out in your forest wild. <laughs> underneath an oak tree, go underneath a bush that's been there for a long time, and underneath a layer of, of leaves. The deeper, the better, and it's there. Ah. But, uh, yeah, it's in my tea. Right. Uh, it's in most very good composts. It's in there. But the the high levels of it come from that ancient the forest. forest. Yeah, so oh. I've also been uh, getting into uh, Bokashi, <coughs> right? And I've been making it myself with oh, yeah. wheat grain, a wheat yeah. gram or something like that yeah. you get from the feed store. Yeah. And a little I, bit of apple cider and... I say that that's a, a brand new two thousand year old art. <laughs> what we what we got there is we have end result is almost the same as tea, but it's a way different way to go about it. The kibashi is what's called as an anaerobic. There's no oxygen in the process of it. You cut off the oxygen, the bacteria is build, they break down the organism. It comes out in such high concentrates that you can dilute it a hundred to one with water. 100 gallons of water to one gallon of kibashi works wonderful. Uh -huh. Tea, when we talk about that, you can also dilute your tea four to one, four parts of water to one part of tea after your soil's been inoculated, the critters are back in, everybody's uh. starting to get happy again, start to do that. Mostly, not mostly, pretty much 100% for uh, financial considerations. I use tea full strength all year round. I don't dilute it. Uh, but my customers are very, very happy diluting it four to one after, oh, okay. after several applications at right, full, right. full strength. Because you build up a certain vitality in mm -hmm. the soil already and it doesn't need and that much. Start to yeah, it. people have been telling me that everybody seems to be over fertilizing when you especially have powder fertilizers or so on. And I was using Yeah, that. another on along that line, you know, we talk about the mycorrhizal. The plant when it gets a good dose it is it kicks up its ability to absorb. I've seen many, many examples. One of the primaries is this uh, uh, Fox Farm Ocean soil. Yeah. Great soil, but it's really hot. Ah. You put a plant in it, and you don't do anything, and everything is fine. But you put any fertilizer to it at all, fish, you put, any, you put tea to it, which the mycorrhizals get into it, mm. the plant starts to absorb more, and the plant immediately shows signs of, of overnutrition, the leaves ends turn. Yeah, oil, I've had that start. problem. I've had that problem. Another yeah. thing about the over, I was using that um, soy based. Uh, what is it called? The uh, farm grower secret or something like that. The soy uh -huh, grower secret. Yep. Right, uh -huh. and it's very very potent. It's twelve zero zero. Right. Got to be careful because especially and, and again when you put the teas on it, it's not so much that you're increasing the fertilization 
volumes, but now the plant's absorbing it more. It's absorbing it right, better. Right. Uh, yeah. And literally, like I said earlier in our conversation, you can cut back 70% mm, right. in your fertilization. Well, see, also, uh, Jackson was telling me that uh, if your soil happens to be dry, and I don't have a sprinkle system, which I'm going to install this year, I really love to water by hand. But if I, if you put the, the, the nutrient on before you water, then the plant tries to take all the nutrient up with the water all at once. So yeah, the, you have the, to... Hmm? Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say you want to get the water, the, the, your soil wet with your regular watering before yeah. you put the nutrient onto it. Not only with nutrients, but with the tea. With the tea. Here's ah. the multicell organisms, even the, uh, even the bacteria, they, they're what we call hydroscopic. They must have a moisture level to move. They hit dry soil and they stop. So when we're using tea, I always recommend that the soil be watered the day before. All right, okay. So it has a, a right. not wet, but has just a nice moisture level to it, and the organisms will just rapidly disperse. And so it through distributes it. through the whole soil yeah. uh, area, yeah. the yeah. root area. Yeah, they don't like dry soil. I see. Yeah. So that's something I just learned. Yeah. It's like same, I'm getting same thing. All, because it wants to pull all up because it wants the water. It's hungry. It it's wants thirsty. the water, right? Give me some and then stuff. <laughs> all, if, if the water is so loaded with the nutrients, it's going to go into kind of a shock. Yeah. And yeah. so that's a tough lesson to learn <laughs> sometimes. But yeah. the thing is, if you do that, you can keep flushing out and flushing yeah. out. It's not, it it's does not lethal necessarily. Yeah, you don't need to tear your plants out right. and throw them if away. If you see they that little, recover. the edge of the leaf will start to be bright yellow, right? Yeah, Just they the, start a slight curl. And they curl, and right. And the tips go yellow. Right. And that means you've kind of over-fertilized heavily on the nitrogen, right? And so at that point, if you just stop giving it anything and just water it a lot, a lot, of course, well, in a drought, it's it. hard to do. <laughs> yeah, flush, yeah. Flush it out. And well, it luckily, will that normally occurs in the early growth stages of the plant. So typically in the spring, you got a little bit more water left than you to do me, with the fall. it happened later, actually, which was, uh, which was kind of tough. So. Yeah, with you. I, yeah. I always have mine occur at the early stages, and then I realized what was going on. Yeah, right. And, well, that's the key thing. And then through the is... rest of it, I, I understood the situation. Right. Yeah. But see, that's the thing about growing. Every year there's something, right? And what it was last year is not going to be what it was this year. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. <laughs> and so yeah, that's that one of the things that every farmer at some point has to overcome that year's crisis, and that shapes your, your final product. Right? Yeah. So... How are we doing on time? We uh, we got two more minutes here on our normal <laughs> thing. So is there anything you want to really kind of... Uh, well, I would just say uh, chlor make sure there's no chlorine in your water. Important part. Yeah. Uh, with, if you're brewing tea, never turn off your air pump until that container is That's, completely It does empty. take electricity for this. Very little yeah, bit of little, electricity. 150 electricity. watts or something like that. I mean, but we're it does gonna, take it for 24 hours. Yeah, we're going to brew 150 gallons of tea with about 150 watts of electricity. That's pretty That's big thing. Yeah, yeah. Never turn your air pumps off. When you have a machine, clean it immediately. The minute the fluid comes out. Leave the air pump on. If you're using a diaphragm pump, which you should for dispersing the tea rather than a rotary pump, because the rotary pump will shred and kill, especially the mycorrhizal, ah. the higher organisms. Uh -huh. You want to be into a diaphragm. A little technical detail. Soft chambers makes them easier. Leave all of that stuff running. Take your hose, clean out your tank, let everything flush out through the system, feed it to a very happy bush or tree by, and your life will be much easier. If you let it dry, it will become a nightmare for you. You'll be disenchanted. You won't use it. So Cleanliness is next to godliness, they are saying. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you want to learn more, we're, we're at, um, what are we at? We're at Synergy T, or SynergyAgPro.com. Okay. S-Y-N-E-R-G-Y-A-G-P-R-O.com. We're based down in Santa Rosa. If I'm not in the office, I'm on the cell phone. And give me a call. <laughs> right. I and this is the chat. whole thing. Now, the whole cannabis community wants to move towards this sustainable agriculture. We can't really call it permaculture at this point, but make it so that what you're getting to feed your plants is as much as possible coming from your land. Use fewer and fewer products off the shelf and in yeah. bottles. And let's, you know, let's just get really... We can lead the whole agricultural world with, uh, with this amount. And so thank you very much. See you later. Thank you.